Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Um, I'm really thrilled, actually, to have a, an opportunity to come back and look at the um, Rudbeck blocks. In fact, I, I wasn't the L50. In fact, I first um, heard about the block, knew about the blocks from this um, exhibition catalogue, um, um, from an exhibition in Uppsala, which took place in 1986. Um, and um, where they are mentioned, and that was the first I knew about them. I first looked at them here in 2016, in fact. Um, so I'm, as I say, I'm delighted to, to be asked to do this talk because it sort of prompted me to come and look at the blocks again. And um, I think I found out a lot more about them than, than before, um, which I will now be able to report to you. Um, so you heard it here first. So I'll start my um, PowerPoint um, if I can. Um, that is not going to go into the first slide, so I may have to backtrack a bit. Um, that's not where I want to start. Um, OK, so I've got um, a PowerPoint presentation, which is supposed to take about 20 minutes. I'll try and keep to that. Um, and then we'll actually look at the blocks themselves. So the first question is, how did Rubeck's remains um, end up in London? In um, 1789, uh, James Edward Smith published this um, a book called uh, Reliquiae Rudbeckianae, uh, Rudbeck's remains or, or, the, or the relics of Rudbeck. Um, and continuing, if we go on with the translating the title as best I can, so it's Rudbeck's remains or the Elysian Fields, book the first by Olaf Rudbeck, father and son, printed at Uppsala in 1702, to which are added the Linnaean names, of course, together with some other images intended for Rudbeck's books, hitherto unpublished, and it's edited by James Edward Smith, um, printed in London in 1789 at the expense of the author, of the editor. So Olaf Rudbeck, um, the elder, um, was um, he established the first botanic garden at Uppsala in 1655, and he was appointed professor of medicine in 1660. He was an auto, also an important anatomist and one of the independent discoverers of the lymphatic system, which led to a famous dispute with Thomas Bartholin, who discovered the system at the same time. He built an anatomy theatre at Uppsala and conducted public dissections, and the anatomy theatre is still there. He was also an archaeologist and philologist and believed that he had proved that Sweden was the original Atlantis, making Sweden the first civilized country in the world. And I'm sure they still think the same. In his son, Olaf um, Rudbeck the Younger, um, continued the philological researches and he took his medical degree at Utrecht University in 1690 and returning home to his country in 1692 succeeded his father as professor of medicine at Uppsala University and he took over the botanic garden um, and with his father um, he worked on the, the, campi, the campus Elysia, the Campi Elysii. Um, so here is the um, title page of um, the second volume, which was the first to be published. We'll come back to that. Um, and his, the plan was to, to um, I mean, the Rudbeck the Elder's plan, um, which he worked on for most of his life, was a publication that was going to include woodcuts of all known plants in the world in actual size. And you can, but in fact, and he worked on it with um, his family members, um, his two daughters, his son, the younger Rudbeck, um, students, other colleagues. Um, but in fact, as published, it just comes out as um, Oli Rudbecki, Patris et Filii, father and son. Ten volumes were projected, and they were going to have between 10 and 11,000 woodcuts for plants. And over 3,200 wood blocks had been cut. Um, um, or in fact, I've read one account that said 7,000, but I think the 3,200 um, is more likely for a, a, a reason which we can come back to. And um, the first volume to be published was volume two, in fact, in 1701, um, followed by uh, volume one in 1702. In um, uh, on the 16th of May, 1702, a fire broke out in Uppsala and destroyed most of the town, or three quarters I've read in one account. And all but two copies of volume one, and about 20 copies, in fact, of volume two, um, the manuscripts for the remaining volumes, and all but 144 blocks were lost in the fire. Uh, 
The younger Rudbeck's um, student was, of course, Karl Linnaeus. And Rudbeck had a very high regard for both the Rudbecks. And, and so the, um, the genus Rudbeckia is actually named for, for both of them. The younger Rudbeck's library was sold at auction in 1741, but the auction catalogue doesn't include the blocks, so, I'd, so we don't know how um, Linnaeus acquired them. Linnaeus, um, Linnaeus's son inherited Linnaeus's collection, um, and on, at his death, um, at the, Linnaeus's son's death, um, everything was sold and purchased by James Edward Smith um, for the bargain price of a thousand pounds. And the collection arrived in London in 1784. Um, as Isabel said, Smith founded the Linnaean Society in 1788. And after his death in 1828, um, his library and the Linnaean collections were purchased by the Society um, now for £3,000. Uh, I think another bargain. Anyway, that's how um, Rudbeck's remains ended up in London, including the blocks for Volume 1 and proof impressions of them, which we'll look at later. But so first, um, I want to give you some background um, on um, the use of wood blocks wood, wood, for, for woodcut illustration um, in, uh, in botanical literature. Um, we always talk about the image printed in the book as a woodcut um, and the, the, the block from which is printed as a wood block. So it's slightly confusing. Um, but woodcut illustration we're talk, we're, is, is a term used for the actual printed image. The um, earliest herbals um, using woodcut illustrations, um, the first um, of which is the um, pseudo Apuleius in, printed in Rome um, around 1481. And these early uh, woodcut herbals used um, manuscript sources for the most part, um, which after sort of repeated copying had meant that a lot of the images had become quite simplified. Um, and although, there are exceptions to this. I mean, the, the, the famous exception is the um, the Gart de Gesundheit uh, Mainz in 1485, where um, some of the plants were actually drawn from life and were beginning to get much more naturalistic illustration. Nonetheless, um, these very um, schematic illustrations continued to be used um, um, well here in 1491 and sort of continuing on into the um, first three decades of the 16th century. Um, so how were these blocks made, the wood blocks made, which printed the wood cuts? Here, um, in a, this is a book of trades um, published um, with, with um, poems by Hans Sachs, um, printed at Frankfurt in, 16, in 1568. And the um, image of the block cutter has a poem underneath, um, which um, is, can be translated um, as follows. So the block cutter is t telling us, I am a good block cutter, and anything you draw for me with a quill on a plank of wood, I will cut with my knife. When you print it, the image will be as precise and as clear as it was drawn and as artistic, and you can use a brush to fill it in, which, which I think means you, you can colour it. Now, this is an extraordinarily um, important statement. Um, and it's worth going going through it carefully. Um, so he says, anything you draw for me with a quill on a plank of wood, I will cut with my knife. So the, the drawing is actually drawn on the block, and then he's cutting it with a knife. Um, and then he says that when you print it, the image will be as precise and as clear as it was drawn and as artistic. The point here um, is that um, the, the block cutter is cutting around the line, the line's drawn on the block and he's cutting away from the line. So the line becomes developed as the line that prints. Um, the, the knife, it's a knife, it's not a, not a chisel or a gouge, which some people say, it is a knife. And um, here's Papillon showing you the first exercise. And you can see the knife is held like a pen. Um, it's drawn towards the worker and on the, on the plank grain of wood with the, with the wood, with the, the grain of the wood running parallel to the surface. Um, this is why you have to use a knife and why you have to pull it towards you, because otherwise you, you, you digs into the grain. This 
um, triple portrait at the end of um, Fuchs de Historia Sterpium, 1542, 1542, shows on the right um, the artist um, Albertus Meyer drawing on a piece of paper um, the corn cockle in the, in the vase. And on the left, um, Heinrich Fulmaurer um, is transferring the image from the paper um, by eye onto the block of wood. So he's drawing it on the plank of wood, just as um, uh, Hans Sachs' block cutter tells us. And the, um, the block cutter is shown below um, Vitus uh, Rudolf Speckel. Um, interestingly, I think he's wearing rather grander clothing, and I think this is because he was paid more than the artists for the simple reason that it took longer to cut a block uh, than to draw a plant. Um, here are two um, blocks which were drawn but not cut, and these were prepared for an un, uh, for another uh, a second edition of um, the Historia Sterpium, which never appeared. And you can see the defects in the block, which the um, when they were transferring the drawing, they would need to to avoid. This is one of the Rudbeck blocks, and this is. To me, I mean, this is the most exciting discovery, which I which I saw first, as I say, about eight years ago. I don't know of anything else like this. There are other partially cut blocks. There's a famous block um, uh, designed by by Bruegel um, in the Met in New York, but it's not. It, it doesn't show the sort of progress in the way that this don does. And what you can see. Um, up the top left, you can see how the how the cutter has gone round the image. Um, I think the reason that this one is that this on this, we'll look at this more again later. The reason I think there's ink on this, I think he was probably taking or she was taking a progress proof uh, to see how it was getting on. And then um, another image down at the bottom. And then on the right at the bottom here, um, it's difficult to see, but when we look at the block, we'll see it more caf more clearly. Um, the background has been cleared out with 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 gouges. Um, but uh, so this sequence is absolutely fascinating, and as I say, not seen anywhere else. Where you start by cutting around the image, you then clear out the voids. You can see the the the, the voids more clearly um, in this Mattioli block. 1562, um, and you can see here very clearly how how the voids are cleared out with chisels. You can see the uh, and gouges. You can see the gouge marks, whereas the the image itself, as I say, has been defined with a knife. I mean, a lot of um, I mean, modern um, woodblock artists do use gouges to define the image, but that was not the case um, in in this early period. So. As I say, after these uh, the early herbals, um, the, based on Renaissance source on, on manuscript sources, but with some um, naturalistic images, we get the trio of the great um, Renaissance herbals of Brunfels, 1530, Fuchs, 1542, and Mattioli, 1562. And um, Brunfels, the, the images in Brunfels are famous. They were designed by Hans Weiditz, who was an associate of Dürer's, um, some say pupil of Dürer. Um, and they're famous not so much in this image, but they're famous for showing the, an, a, an actual specimen with sort of often with wilted leaves and broken stems and so on. Once um, then for Fuchs in 1542, he wanted his artists um, to, to produce much more analytical images. And in a sense, they were, in a sense, they're illustrations of a, of a species rather than an, an individual specimen. Um, and they're very sort of wiry outlines, which could be colored um, very easily. The Mattioli blocks um, are, again, more naturalistic in a sense, but often very art, very artfully ar arranged and with a lot of shading. Um, so they don't, uh, you know, that doesn't really make sense to color them. I mean, just wanted to show you this quickly to show you sort of different styles of of, of, of cutting. The only thing which is fascinating about these books, these three books, is that the, the blocks are very large. Um, the Fuchs blocks are 36 centimeters tall, the biggest ones. Um, whereas the majority of herbals uh, during the 16th century um, use much smaller blocks. Um, these blocks here are about 10 centimeters tall. Um, and I think this allowed for a much more flexible layout. It's a very sort of simple layout in a sense. I mean, you've got this, the rectangular block and then the type can be set round it. Um, 
not as easy as it sounds, but still relatively relatively straightforward. And the great thing is woodblocks don't wear, you can print tens of thousands of impressions from them um, without significant wear. And um, so the advantage of these small woodcuts um, was that they could be used in many different books. Um, the um, Plantin firm in Antwerp um, ended up with a, a stock of over 4,000 blocks, um, which still survive. Um, and they could be used again and again in different, in new editions and indeed in works, um, you know, use the same block in a, in a work by a different author. So, um, I mean, the, the, the Plantin Press in particular was, was printing the works of Dodun's Clusius and Lebel. But they were also, I mean, on one occasion, um, they rented out the blocks, 2,500 blocks were rented out um, to the London publishers of uh, the second edition of Gerard's Herbal in, in 1636. Um, they had a lot of trouble getting the blocks back and they never did, they never let them out of the house again. Um, but that is another story. But these, so some of these, I don't know, I don't know, I haven't actually um, checked on these particular blocks, but some of the blocks in the London Gerard 1636 had actually first been printed in Antwerp 17, 73 years earlier in, in 1563. So that's a sort of brief um, history of um, woodcut illustration, very brief, and how they were printed. And now um, let's turn to um, the campus, uh, the Campi Elysii itself. Um, the two volumes um, which were produced before the fire, I think are very, I mean, they're extraordinary, as we'll see in a minute, but I, I hope you can see already here, but the, the, they're, they're enormous woodcuts. They're bigger than the Fuchs woodcuts. And they're, you know, they're very, very um, uh, flamboyant, if you like, um, decorative. Um, and um, I think that, I mean, look, well, obviously the botanical intent of the Campi Elysi as a world flora is not in doubt, but the layout of the pages, um, I don't know whether I've got another one. Yes, I mean, here, I think the layout of the pages um, is has more the character of a, of a florilegium than a herbal. So we've got very brief um, descriptions, um, brief descriptions at the top, um, synonyms, um, but no medical, no medical uses at all. So this is really much more of a, it is a flora rather than a florilegium. And yet um, it's got these very decorative images and they started, I think, I'm sure really they, that the, the volume two was published first because of the appeal of some of the um, the plant, the bulbous plants, the, the, the tulips, the irises, this and so on. Um, and I just wanted to pause on this one and think about this arrangement because if, I mean, by this stage, um, most of the, um, I mean, from the around 1600, um, the Florilegia in particular, um, but most many, many floras had moved over to using engraving, um, which meant much finer lines and much more um, modeling could be achieved by crosshatch shading and stippling and so on. This is the famous Hortus Aistatensis, uh, 1613. So um, nearly, I mean, not much um, less than 100 years before uh, Rudbeck. Um, but you can see the sort of decorative nature, but you can see also the way that the plants are intertwined. Um, in the Rudbeck, um, they, they're individual blocks, as we, can, as we, as we will see, um, but the layout of the pages is sort of, uh, is quite involved. And in order to get them to fit together, um, they actually had to cut out parts of the, of the blank areas of the blocks, which we'll, which we'll see later. So the young, um, the younger Rudbeck, um, one of the younger, sold the blocks um, together with the with the two printed volumes to um, the the entomologist and very wealthy industrialist Charles de Yer, um in about seventeen thirty eight, and those volumes are now um, at the University um, of Uppsala. So these are the um, these are the volumes of the original drawings which were which were prepared, and this is the um, introduction to the um, the website pages where they are all digitized. Um, and um, the author of this, um, Helena 
Bachmann, there are about there are about three thousand five hundred watercolors, which is why I think that possibly, I mean, it just happens that that's about the same the number of blocks that that people have said had been cut. Um, and what Helena Bachmann writes here is that Rud Rudbeck's ambition was to depict all of the world's known plants in natural size. And in order to achieve this, he used printed botanical works as well as living and pressed plants, for instance, from the Bursa Herbarium. At the time, this herbarium was kept at Uppsala University Library, but today it's part of the collection of the Uppsala Museum of Evolution. His children, Olof Rudbeck the Younger, Johanna Christina Rudbeck, and Wendela Rudbeck, as well as his students and other relatives and friends helped draw the sketches. All the pictures from these 11 volumes have now been digitized and are available through the Albion platform for digital collections and cultural heritage, they're super digitizations. Um, it's interesting that there are 11, in fact, there are, the volumes are numbered 11, uh, sorry, 2 to 11, 2 to 12, I beg your pardon, and volume 1, is missing and volume one is the grasses which is which is what's in volume one of the printed volume so whether there's a connection now i don't know but it's intriguing i'll just show you one example because this isn't really the, the, our subject today but one example of how the um watercolor drawing or sort of watercolor and some body color i think um was translated into the woodblock and i think this is a wonderful example because you can see how um this leaf um on the left here uh, um, has become more curled and more um, sort of more flamboyant, I think, and 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 in and in the in the woodcut. So I think the, the important thing to to remember here is that at every stage, um, the sort of artistic decisions can be made. So obviously, between doing the watercolor making a drawing on the block for the block cutter to cut round. Maybe the person who drew on the block was also the block cutter, um, uh, has introduced um, a, a, another a, a, another sort of artistic um, interpretation. So multiple people are always involved in, in image making in, 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 in printed books. Um, so here are, is another page from volume two. Um, and you can see at the bottom, that there are a couple of signatures on the blocks, and one is ICR, and the other is WR. Okay, so I mean, this has got to, this just seems to me too much of a coincidence because remember, Rudbeck's daughters are, are Johanna Christina Rudbeck and Wendela Rudbeck. Now, at this stage, at this time, initials on blocks generally um, are the block cutter rather than the designer. We can't be sure of that, but I think it's much less likely that these are the block cutters. My interpretation of this is that that um, Johanna Christina and Wendela Rudbeck were actually cutting the blocks. And we know um, that, that and so there are other blocks which were initialed OR for Olaf Rud Olaus Rudbeck the Elder. And we know that Rudbeck um, trained the block cutters himself. So it makes sense that he was training his daughters uh, to cut the blocks. There are about in other other images. Um, there are, there are other initials. They're quite rare. Most of the blocks don't have initials, which is per perfectly normal. Um, and about ten sets of initials can be found. So it, again, it sort of emphasizes the number of people um, who are involved in making books like this. It's not just the two people who who the old the two names that appear on the title page. Um, the blocks that we've got here, the blocks that, that survive, are the blocks that were made for the first volume, which came out second. Um, there's no the title page was perhaps never printed, but certainly it doesn't exist in the two surviving copies. And again, um, although I think um, they published the, the, the tulips and irises first <clears throat> for good commercial reasons, um, they certainly weren't um, holding back on the sort of decorative effects of the um, of the grasses and so on. And here, here's another example of some um, initials. And guess what? Um, it's it, it's our friends um, Johanna Christina and Wendela Rudbeck again. I think because this copy was sold by Rudbeck to um, Charles de Hier. Um, I think these annotations, um, I think all these annotations 
um, are by the young, are by the, well, they could be by either Rudbeck, um, but I think they are by one of the Rudbecks, but these have never been studied as far as I'm aware. So um, then I think one, what, where are we going from here? Um, so yes, I think there's just one more slide I wanted to show you, um, which is this one, because I mentioned earlier that when we were looking at volume two, um, the way that the blocks were sort of nested together. And and this block, you can see, we'll look at the block in a minute, but it's easier to look at it on the slide. I just wanted to show you how it's been cut out around here. And the reason for that is that this um, block had been set next to it. And so this block must have a sort of shape like this. But you can see that if you took a rectangle down here, um, the, there wouldn't be any place to put the block. And this is this is very unusual. I think that um, mostly um, woodcut plant illustrations, the blocks were square or rectangular rather. Um, and as we saw in the case of the Gerard Herbal, um, a very sort of straightforward layout with rectangular blocks and, and blocks of text flowing around them. Good. Um, so I'm going to stop there and that should give us time, I hope, um, to look at some blocks and books um, and have some discussion. So, Will, can you get us back on, get us onto the camera? So, first of all, um, let's have a quick look at um, the at volume two, which is which is the which is the first volume to be produced, and um, of which about twenty copies exist. And this is the this is the one that Smith acquired with the Linnaean collections. So it says um, a, a, a Bibliotheca Lin, Linnaeus, seventeen eighty four. So this came into the into the library into into Smith's hands in seventeen eighty four. Um, and just a few pages very quickly. Um, there are some irises and is this, are we seeing this all right? Yes, looks good. Um, but you can see, I mean, now that we've got the actual book in front of us and you can see the site, you know, my hand, you can see these are really, really, really big blocks. Um, what else did I mark? Um, I mean, it's all, it's all extraordinary. Um, there's nothing else like this. Um, and there is the, um, there's the fritillary, which I showed you the drawing for with the, with the lovely curl here. And um, some alliums. There we are. I mean, we could go on and on. Um, it is absolutely fabulous. Um, and you can find uh, digitized copies of this online. Um, so let's move on. So that, at the same time <clears throat> as the um, second volume of the Campi Elysium, Elysium um, Smith also acquired a volume of proofs of the blocks. I don't know why... Um, these were made, but again, um, we can see from the title page, um, I mean, I haven't, I mean, here it says, um, Iconis 21, I'm not sure what the 21 refers to, I haven't worked that out yet. Maybe there were other volumes of, of images, um, and it says, ex, um, ex termo primo operis rarissimi, uh, um, of uh, clarissimi rebecchi campi elisi dictu, known as, or called campi elisi, and it's from the Library of Linnaeus, 1784, J.E. Smith. And then what these are, quite extraordinary, these are proofs of the blocks, rather rather crudely printed. Uh, this one's upside down, um, and often you can see the the outline of the block. The the sides of the block have picked up ink and have printed. So here are some of the large blocks, um, and um, so it goes on. Here you can see the edge of the block picking up ink. Um, 
And I don't know what, I mean, whether this was done as a kind of inventory of the blocks, I don't know, but it's, it seems to have been done by somebody who didn't really know what they were doing, because um, in some cases, I think I hope I've marked that. Can, Will, can you get to if it's the one I want? Yes, you see, in some cases, where uh, because because Rudbeck <clears throat> is doing everything in in <clears throat> in natural size, full size, he often has to sh in, show a plant in two parts. Um, so here, um, this is the the bottom of the stem, and then he's actually there's actually a little letter A here and a letter A here because obviously you've got to imagine joining that on up here, but. I know, oh, so you see what I, so I know whether you can, anyway, but here, this is the bottom part of a plant, but the block for the top part is somewhere else. So, as I say, whoever put this together, they were just getting the blocks, inking them up, printing them. Um, but it is very useful because it gives us an indication of what, of how many blocks survived. There are, um, I think, 135 blocks were printed in these proofs. And um, when Smith printed the Reliquiae, which we'll look at next, um, there are 11 blocks which were not proofed, so we get up to 144. That's where I get my number of 144 from. So we look next at the Reliquiae. So this is this is Smith's copy of the Reliquiae. Um, rather fun. I mean, this is, I mean, wait a second, Will, because rather confusingly at first, it's actually bound up with um, two or three other works um, and rather lovely um, um, coloured engravings. Um, this is, of course, quite typical um, that if you've got thin books, you bind them together uh, to save money. So here is the... Um, Here's Smith's Reliquiae, um, and um, presented to the Linnaean Society, May the 5th, 1789, by the editor. Um, so this is the copy that he gave to the, to the Society. And we'll look at this um, in a bit more detail when we look at the blocks, because it's sort of easiest to look to use this um, to match up with, with the blocks. So we'll just leave that. Oh, yes, I want to actually, let's, before I say anything else, so this is interesting because you see how there's a big gap here. So obviously when Smith um, had the blocks, there were already, some of them were broken. Um, and he doesn't print all of the blocks um, that he, that are proofed. <clears throat> so I assume he, assume that he had 144 blocks with the proofs. We don't know that for sure, but I assume that some of them were already broken and some probably just were, were unusable. So um, he only used um, a, a smaller number of them, 94, I think. So let me start um, <clears throat> with the, um, the uncut block. Now, can we, now this of course doesn't appear anywhere. Is that, is that showing up reasonably well, Will? Yeah. 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 And you can, can you see here the way the one at the bottom has been routed out? And you can also see, um, obviously, this huge amount of worming. Clearly, when Smith had the blocks, there are no wormholes vis visible in the impressions in the reliquiae. So all this worming happened since 1789, I'm afraid. Um, I suspect um, that it's due to sort of Victorian heating with very little ventilation. So sort of hot and warm, you know, hot and damp. Um, probably just what the woodworms like. The wood is, as I said, uh, most of the wood is pear wood, and pear wood um, has a very characteristic grain. Sometimes there's sort of purplish or sort of pinkish streaks in it. I'm not so clear there, um, but they are they are pear wood. Um, <clears throat> some of them we don't. Night. Oh yes, this this let's show you this one next. This is one of the ones that has, as I say, a small number of blocks um have um have initials. And I don't know whether you can see, but there are the initials um that are sort of actually cut standing up in, in the block. Difficult to see, but but they are there. Then let's just look at a few 
um, with the with the pages. So if we go well, if we go to page five. Right here. So this is the block for this. So it was prints like that. And here, you know, this is obviously an example um, that's been that's been notched out so that another block um, can be printed next door to it. Also, um, at the bottom, um, I don't know whether you remember, but in the um in the in the pages of of the of the printed volumes, um, the original 1702 printed volume, there's often text on at the bottom identifying the plant and so these little notches here are so that the printer can set type up up to the block um and you can see the the, the, the i hope the sort of delicacy when it's difficult to see of, of the cutting um and the gouging around and obviously much and then you know, we see the gouge marks here and obviously much more much more ink on it um than on the um the trial block, the unfinished block. Um, here is another one. If we go to 6.1, see that? And again, look at the, the size, it's extraordinary. And you obviously you use whatever wood you can get hold of. And in this case, the, um, the piece of pear wood is not thick enough. So a pine board has been nailed onto the back to bring it up to the correct height um, to, for, for the printer to work with. But, you know, obviously the, you know, they had this piece of wood, why waste it? Um, we, can always, we can always make it up um, to get it to the right thickness. And you can see the sort of delicacy of the cutting of these hairs on the, on the leaves. But again, and also the, the sort of very decorative arrangement and I think now when you see the block, I mean, you can really see why, in a sense, that leaf bends back over the top. It's not because that's how it grew. It's because he wanted to fit it on the block. Or she. Do we need that's another. Let's have a look. Let's move actually move on to number so we got page 26 um so this is the one that um is i think this was reproduced in the Linnea and l50 and the treasures book um and is absolutely wonderful and again i mean the sort of wonderfully decorative effect of the um of the line going over the top actually this one's easier to see because for some reason the the voids haven't picked up so much ink um Probably the voids get inked actually not so much when it's being printed, but more when the block's being cleaned um, with solvents. So, um, but anyway, you can see, um, I think quite, this is, you can see the cutting, I think much more clearly on this, perhaps than on some of the other ones, because the, the backgrounds are cleaner. And um, you can see how, where there's a big void, um, it's cut much more deeply. Um, whether you can see that but this goes down a long way and this is the reason for this is that you're printing with um damp handmade paper um and with and the tympan of the press that, that presses the paper onto the block um is also damp and and has um, blankets in padding in it and so the paper can easily sag down um and so if you don't cut the big white areas away very deeply, the uh, um, the paper will pick up the ink. Where there's a lot of um, image, the paper is, is is held up, so the paper isn't going to pick up any 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 muck here. But but if this has got ink on it by mistake, um, it would pick up the ink if it wasn't nice and nice and deep. So that's the reason for that. Um, and then let's just have a look at a, the cutaway one, which I showed you um, on the slides. And um, so this is on page um, 26. Mm. Did we get that right? Six must be no, there. I beg your pardon. I've moved, I've switched, have I switched them around? <laughs> 20... Is that not back at the beginning? Something's gone wrong. <laughs> is it at the beginning? These is both say page this? 26. Oh, or... no, I beg your pardon. It's a different pattern. Yeah. It's... Well, um, it doesn't, um, in a sense, it doesn't, the, the, 
the story doesn't work with this because obviously um, what um, Smith's printers are doing are just printing them all separately. So in the way the, the, the cutouts are not necessary in the same way. Um, but I did think it was worth showing you this block um, that since I'd shown it to you in the, um, in, in the slide and this rather lovely feathery top. So just um, just two more blocks, and then then I'm done. Um, these I think are very interesting. So if we go to page um, four, page four, I think we're there. Hmm. So this little block, so is is so obviously now much smaller, um, and this prints this and again we see cutouts because obviously something else must have been printed beside it um, and again we see a piece of pine uh, nailed onto the back um, but some of the I think I'm not sure I think that one's pear wood but what I think is very interesting is that if we go to page eight page 12 So again, to another small block. And I think, I don't know whether you can see um, in the image, but this seems to be it's sort of, it's more precise and slightly blacker, I think. And just from the weight of it and the feel of it, and also the fact that it hasn't got any, um, sorry, I'm just gonna hold, there we are. There's no worming in it. It feels heavier. Um, I think the cutting is more precise. And I'm fairly convinced that this is actually boxwood, um, not pear wood. And it, and I think this is a boxwood block. Uh, this is also a boxwood block. Um, I didn't. We got that out. Um, so that I think is is very interesting and and something one wouldn't know um, without actually examining the blocks. Um, it is known that boxwood was used. Um, it, there's a famous herbal by Durante, um, where, where, which actually says in the book that the blocks are cut in, bo in boxwood. Uh, but boxwood also comes into its own in the 19th century when it was used as end grain um, for doing wood engraving, which is another story. But this is boxwood, but it's not wood engraving. It's, it's, it's wood cut, cut on, on, the, on the plank with the, with, with, the grain, with the grain going this way. Good. Um, so I think, I mean, I think what these blocks tell us, they, I mean, the, the uncut block tells us a lot about how the blocks were actually made. I think all these cutouts tell us a lot about how they're printed, how, they're, how they have to be sort of jigsawed together, um, which is something which, which is unusual in this book. And, and the size of these blocks is, is unusual. And I think, I think having the opportunity to look at these blo blocks has also then sort of drawn, for me at any rate, has sort of drawn attention you know, back to this, um, to the Reliquiae, back to the original, to the two printed volumes of, of Campi Lizzie, which are really very little known, I think partly because it was a, an aborted project or because of the fire, only two of the 10 volumes appeared. But I think it, it's important to, to, be, to be brought back to it because it is, it would have been, I think it would have, it would have been one of the really great um, uh, botanical books of all time. And, I don't think that at this time, I'm not aware of any other projects to produce a world flora. I think this would have been the, the first world flora, but may, um, maybe people have other views on that. Good, so that's what I want to say. Um, so now I'd, I'd love to hear what, what everybody thinks. Thank you so much, Roger. Um, th that was wonderful. Thank you. Learned a lot about our own collections, which is great. <laughs> uh, I've got uh, so we've got about ten minutes for questions, and there's uh, there's a few. I've deleted some of them. There were quite a few about the wood, which I think you've uh, you've answered quite well. Um, and there were some questions about the little holes as well, which I think you've uh, indicated that there were uh, worms. So I think uh, those are answered. Um, there are a few, there's an interesting question from Mary Webb who says, it's basically, could plant material be placed into a platter of ink, then placed on the wood and pressed down to leave an impression to be carved by the block cutter, which I guess is, it would be um, a mixture of nature printing and woodcut. Um, I've never heard 
no. of such a thing. It sounds it's brilliant. I mean, I love it. Why not? Um, I think it would work. Um, I just I'm just not aware that anybody. I mean, I've never read any account of anybody doing it. Maybe they did. I think this is fascinating. Thank you. Mm. Um, someone asked, are the Finnish woodcuts mirror images? And I think you did show that by reversing it. But I wonder. I was wondering for these people out there who are not familiar with uh, whether yes. you could say. Yes, I think that they are. I mean, obviously, as you with the block, when it's printed on the page, obviously the, what's on the block then comes out on the page in the opposite sense. Um, when I showed you the, the drawing beside the wood block, I think you will have noticed that that was reversed from the drawing. Um, and the reason for that is that if... If the block cutter is is looking, you know, looking at the drawing and looking at the block, or or transferring the drawing by eye, um, it's much easier to to transfer the drawing in the same sense. It was perfectly possible to reverse it by tracing and various other processes, but it's much simpler um, to simply take the drawing and copy it onto the block and cut it in the same sense as the drawing, which means that when it's printed, it's going to be in the reverse sense. Thank you. There's a couple of questions about the uh, the size of of the of the drawings and the size of the plants. So, um, Gina asks, uh, do you think that the modification to the wood blocks were done in part to accommodate the drawing to the size of the blocks? But uh, but then someone else asks, are these to life scale? So, what's the kind of scale of of? Uh, yes, I mean, I think I mean they they're apparently like I mean they're said to be life scale. I mean that's what he was that's what he was doing. I think. Um, I haven't looked at enough of the drawings to be sure, but I'm pretty sure that the draw I mean, the volumes of the drawings are, are not big enough either. So that I think both in the drawings and in the blocks, um, many of the plants are, are cut in two or even in some cases three. Um, and you, you just have to kind of in your mind's eye put them together. So I think that um, I think that the. I, I wouldn't. I'm. I'm. I don't want to be categorical about the drawings because I've really only just started looking at them. Um, but certainly in the blocks, that's that's the case that that the that they end up um, being 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 cut. So you have to imagine them being put together. And as in that one example I showed you, actually gives you a little letter A saying so. So A goes on to A mm -hmm. and then B, goes on, which is quite unnecessary, but it's quite fun. Uh, Mark Benneke, who is one of our fellows, he's a forensic entomologist, uh, um, <clears throat> does tell us that it's beetle larvae, not worms. Um, so thank you, Mark. Thank and you apologize. very much. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I'd a... love to. I'd love to know more about that. And I know that. I mean, there's this guy. Um, gosh, the name's escaping me from it. It'll, it'll come back to me in a minute. Um, but there is somebody who's done a lot of study of the natural history of the beetles that eat wood. Um, and you can tell where um, where blocks were stored according to the size of the holes in the blocks, as well as I remember. Yeah, and uh, there is another question about uh, the the infestation, and is there a difference in the amount of woodworm infestation? But I think you've answered that in kind of clearly. There seems yeah, to be much more in the in the power wood, and not at all in the boxwood, which is one of the reasons why I'm pretty sure some of them are boxwood. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a few questions about the ink. So um, asking about what the what were the ingredients of the black ink um, and uh, what types of ink were used in the printing process and how were they produced? Um, it's just it's standard standard printer's ink, which is made of, of some kind of carbon um, lamp black. Um, I particularly for printer's ink, um, and so and um, and then obviously the 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 media, so the, the the pigment is is lamp black, which is just pure, basically pure carbon, fairly finely divided. Um, it, it could be made of burnt bones or burnt um, dregs of wine, but but I think for printer's ink it was mostly lamp black, and then um, it's suspended in 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 a in a boiled oil so um, mostly linseed oil or other other drying oils which which are boiled to make a varnish so basically you've got a varnish with pigment um, uh, suspended in it mm -hmm. and um, that's it's it's quite slow drying um, but this is the point about boiling the oil you have to you have to get it to exactly the right consistency so that it doesn't sink into the paper too much but yet um, but but does but does but 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 draws some of the pigment into the surface of the paper and then dries at a reasonable rate. It's it's quite technical. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Someone uh, is asking, has anyone at the Society inked them up and printed from them? I guess 
well, the answer is Smith did in a way by producing. Um, that's right. I think, really I mean, they're now, I mean, the, the ones with woodworm are really very delicate um, and definitely I wouldn't recommend it. I think you could, you could print from the, from the, from the boxwood ones, but you know, that's a curatorial decision. Then you, yeah. you know, you lose some information Then you are, you going to cover up um, what, what kind of ink was used and so on. Um, there's quite a few questions. I, th there's quite a lot of questions and we've got five minutes, so I'm not sure we're going to get through all of them. So apologies uh, for anyone that I don't get to. But there's a, quite a few questions about um, woodcuts versus engraving, um, etc. So um, there's a question that says, why woodcut relief rather than wood engraving in Taglio? Is it due to speed, simplicity, cost, availability of hardwood? Um, and there's another one, if engraving was available at the same time, what informs the choice between woodcut and engraving? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, this is a, a, a hugely important question. I mean, why did Rudbeck go for, mm. for, for, for woodblock uh, at this period when other people were, were using engraving? I think it probably cost. And I think um, we know that he was sort of fully in control of the process, probably in his own house, um, using his and his family were involved. Um, I think it's probably easier to learn to to cut wood than it is to learn to engrave. Um, but it's still uh, they're still very skillful. Um, and um, the problem with engraving is that I mean the, the other cost of implication of engraving is that it has to be printed separately uh, uh, on a separate press, and that sort of and it's much slower than than um, letterpress printing, relief printing. So I think um, I think he probably did it for sort of two reasons: one, one for sort of convenience and control. Um, and also possibly if you, you know, if each block um, represents one species, then he can shuffle them around and re reorder them, um, put them together in different ways. Whereas if he was going to design large copper plates with half a dozen plants on each page, on each plate, then it all has to be more carefully planned from, from, from the outset. So there may be a sort of convenience there, um, but I think it's sort of control and cost. Um, in terms of um, wood wood engraving, um, I just need to say that wood cut and wood engraving are both relief processes. It's incredibly complicated, very, very confusing um, and annoying, really, the nomenclature that we have. Um, the point is that in the 19th, well, from the late 18th century and all through the 19th century, people were making wood engravings, which are engraved with a burin, the tool that the copper plate engraver uses, on the end grain of boxwood. It's still a relief process, but it's called engraving. So mm -hmm. um, it's just one of those irritations. And unfortunately, much of the literature, particularly the older literature, um, doesn't distinguish. So you will often see um, early woodblocks uh, woodcuts um, being described as wood engravings, which is, mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's a, it's a piece of nomenclature, this distinction between woodblock wood engraving, which actually only really came into play in the 19th century. So the older literature is, but as I say, but even a lot of current literature gets it wrong. Um, mm -hmm. just... Okay. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth uh, asks, is the tonal effect in the print a direct result of how the block was cut or scored initially, or is it the tonal effect um, or sorry, or is the tonal effect of post-printing addition? It, it's all in the block. Um, I mean, yeah. some of them are printed rather, rather lightly, so you can see the texture of the paper, and sometimes you can't actually ever see any grain of the wood. But that's not the intention. The intention is that you cut away what you don't want to print. And so in the more elaborate woodcuts, like um, like in Mattioli or going back, you know, Albrecht Dürer, um, you find a lot of cross-hatching. So they could build up tonal um, values um, by cross-hatching. Uh, but it's, it's difficult to do in woodcut. And you're not getting much of that in uh, the Rudbeck blocks. They're, they're, they're relatively simple in that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think I'm going to, um, uh, we're nearly at the end. So here's the last question. Um, did Rudbeck make wood blocks of other things in the natural world? Um, I 
Yes, I think there are woodcuts. I haven't looked at it. I, you, you've, you've caught me out there. I mean, there was this, <laughs> Sorry. There was this, there was this great book called Atlantis, um, which was also um, came out in, in 1702, um, which is his, his account of why Sweden is the first civilized country in the world. Um, and that does have woodcuts in it. Whether he was involved in them, I don't know. The little, the little rather crude woodcut that I showed you of the Uppsala fire comes from that book. Um, but I haven't looked at it, and I I don't know to what extent he was involved in in making the blocks for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, Roger. That's it's been a um, extremely interesting, um, and the mm. number of questions uh, can relate to that too. Um, I would just wanted to to add also because you've talked a little bit about Fuchs. Um, we are going to have a linear lens on Fuchs with Dr. Sachiko Kuzukawa from the University of Cambridge. I believe that's in July. Um, so keep looking at our website uh, to check uh, on the date of that. Our copy is a beautiful one. It's uh, hand colored um, and um, we thought we'd make a, a special linear lens on it. But the next linear lens, if you have enjoyed this one, uh, will be on Tuesday, the 14th of May. Uh, and we have Jack Ashby, who's assistant director of the University Museum of Zoology in Cambridge. And he will be talking about one of the earliest depictions of the thylacine, uh, which was drawn and painted by John Lewin. And that's on the 14th of May. Um, but in the meantime, as well, we have lots of other events online and on, on site. So uh, please do check our website to find out more. Um, I just want to thank you again, Roger, for coming all the way to present this. It was uh, fabulous. Thank you very much. And um, that's it. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.